Hi, John. Hi, Peter. How are you? Good, thanks, sir. Uh, just to give you the heads up, there'll be no video from me. My comments, yes, but um, I'm trying to get away from the video. Nobody. Okay. Hi, Peter. Are you still there? Okay, I'm back again. I must have okay. accident. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, I'll be there because I am obviously have a PowerPoint I want to put on the file. So, my view do not there. I don't think the PowerPoint will reflect either. Hello, Paul. Don't see him yet.
Hello. Hello, everybody. From Peter. Hi. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, uh, Peter. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, okay, okay. Thank you very much. I'm very sorry for actually being late. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome all the prospective uh, participants to this uh, important webinar. And I would like to welcome our uh, um, president, uh, CGI Institute, Mr. Peter Wells. And I also would like to welcome uh, in this important webinar, the today's keynote speaker, uh, Mr. Uh, John Stoltz and all the respected participants. Uh, we would actually uh, uh, like to start our today's webinar. And again, I'm sorry for uh, actually uh, delayed start. So um, we will actually uh, discuss today um, uh, the introduction of our uh, president and then uh, the, uh, the introduction of the today's keynote speaker. And we will share uh, the uh, presentation uh, on uh, I, uh, CGIA and Institute activities and CGIA Institute, how actually the Institute is working. And, and then actually uh, we uh, request our keynote speaker, Mr. John, to uh, give his uh, nice presentation to the today's um, um, uh, the session and uh, to the um, participants. And then we will actually have a brief question and answer. And, and this is the actually today's session. So this is Peter. I will just temporarily butt in and uh, I do have some comments uh, when it's appropriate, okay? Yeah, yeah, okay. So uh, Hi, everyone. Uh, now I'm introducing our uh, today's uh, actually uh, the, uh, the Institute President, Mr. Peter Edward Wells, who is actually renowned finance and accounting expert with over 40 years of uh, professional experience and is currently the president of the Chartered Global Investment Analyst Institute. He is a CEO, international accounting finance consultant, and trainer of several successful businesses. Peter has chaired the International Special Interest Group of the Financial Executive Networking Group. He has served on the membership and hospitality committee of the Financial Executive Institute and served as a board member for professional accounting bodies. He had been an adjunct professor at the business school of both Golden Gate University and Southern New Hampshire University in USA. He holds a master's degree in finance distinction obtained at Bentley University, USA in 1988. From 1971 to 1973, he studied and obtained an ordinary national certificate in business studies. During the 1973 to 1979 period, he studied the SCCA professional accounting examinations at the London School of Accountancy, UK. So this is a uh, brief about our president, Mr. Peter Edward Wells. And now I would request our president to say welcome address to today's session and to the respected participant.
Peter, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, it, it's a good job I'm very humble. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, yes, uh, thank you so much. Um, and I uh, do have some comments, uh, introductory comments, of course. So anyway, uh, first, of course, hello and good afternoon, John and Mohammed and everybody else. On behalf of the CGIA Institute and myself as president, we welcome you all to today's webinar, Project Finance Mitigating New Risks and uncertainties, a very apropos project in this era we're in. In this talking about this, in this COVID and Delta variants era, this will be a most interesting listen as the so-called norm keeps getting redefined. Last but not least, who or what is the CGIA Institute? Our core objective is to raise highly ethical and skilled financed investment professionals who are committed to improving the world of finance and investment through high ethics and transparency. CGIA is open to membership and applications for all individuals globally who are passionate about a rewarding career in finance and investments and how the CGIA can help them to prepare adequately to achieve their life goals. Remember, all of us here are experiencing this new norm and trying to understand as consultants and finance executives how to interpret what that means. Traditional investment, the risk and reward model we've all come to know, studied at school, needs to be re-evaluated as longevity can no longer be relied upon to generate the yields we've become accustomed to. An inverse yield curve is not out of the question. We can no longer assume business as usual with an upward sloping yield curve taught in business schools. And what does COVID-19 have in store for us? Are we pondering months or years before pre-COVID-19 starts to re-emerge again? Could COVID-19 possibly mutate into a new unknown virus, considering the very low and concerning global vaccination rates? Against this backdrop, poverty is expected to increase due to significant job losses. Certainly, we need to be very cognizant of this new operating environment. Fewer jobs and work from home business models amidst an emotionally charged new environment, along with unknown career ramifications, bringing change and new concepts. As today's webinar will discuss mitigating new risks and uncertainties. Personally, and in conclusion, I'd like to thank again everybody here today and as CGIA's president to wish you an educational and very informative experience. Thank you, everybody. And I hand it back to you. Okay, thank you very much, Peter, for your nice uh, words and
Uh, good day. Can anybody hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, now, uh, actually, uh, this time to uh, uh, present to you the uh, the the, um, the presentation on the CTI Institute to the uh, session, and and I would actually before going to the uh, presentation, I would actually uh, like to give a brief. Um, uh, Introduction uh, I, I would like to give a uh, actually a brief um, Okay, so now we are actually um, going through the presentation on the CGI Institute. Uh, CGI Institute is actually stand for Chartered Global Investment Analyst. And uh, <clears throat> this institution actually uh, started these uh, professional uh, activities uh, a couple of years back and uh, by this time, actually, this institute actually uh, landed in many countries of the world, including the United States and, and many other countries. And we are in Bangladesh also actually performing the activities of this professional institution. And this important profession is actually going forward with uh, a very speed rapidly and uh, the actually professional getting uh, certification and education from this institution are getting important job in the many important uh, industries. So why the actually uh, institution is um, actually providing this actually services and how, how the, uh, the uh, owner of the uh, certification is getting a benefit of this degree. For example, uh, the where the people actually professionals are working now, you can actually see the um, uh, a pie chart and the uh, list of with the indicating percentage of the professional working in the industries. For example, the private equity and venture capital ten percent, and uh, we can say twenty percent of the professional qualified from this institution working in the capital market and equities. And, uh, and uh, the second highest uh, actually absorbing institution is the fixed income uh, industries, uh, having 14% 14 of the professional working in this institution. So a lot of uh, actually areas uh, actually covering um, uh, by the institutional professional providing their services. And what are the uh, positions held by this uh, CGIA professional. For example, CEO position. In many companies, uh, the CGIA professional are holding the position of CEO and chief investment officer, chief financial officer, risk manager, portfolio manager, etc., etc. So uh, very, very important position are held by the CGIA professionals. So now about the memberships. 
So this global uh, professional institution provide the membership in three categories, candidate member. The candidate members are the actually members who get entered into this uh, professional institution and uh, they are actually pursuing for obtaining their CGIA degree. Uh, and the charter holder, the, the professional who completed uh, the 14 papers in three levels are the charter holder and they are awarded by the institute with the CGIA charter. And they are the full member of the institution. And the fellow members are those who obtain fellowship from the institution. They are the very respected actually uh, group of the members in the uh, professor CGI institution. So uh, these are the, the, what does it take to become a CGI charter holder? Look, actually, uh, this is the actually first uh, to decide one candidate first to decide that uh, uh, he or she uh, need this degree and uh, determine to obtain this degree. The curriculum consists of 14 examinable papers structured in three levels. The level one, level two, and level three. And uh, the examination held in four times in a year. Uh, these are actually in January, April, July, and October. The level three uh, actually are consisting uh, level one number, uh, level first level, uh, four papers. These are A1, the investment, paper one, corporate finance, paper one, and uh, financial risk management, paper, uh, and then older alternative investment. So level two consists of six papers and uh, the investment paper one, corporate finance paper two, financial reporting and analysis paper one, investment analysis and portfolio management paper one, derivatives analysis paper one, investment ethics paper one. Then the level three, uh, four papers in this uh, final level, the financial reporting and Uh, and analysis paper two, investment and portfolio management paper two, derivatives analysis paper two, investment ethics paper two. Examination structure, level 170 multiple choice question, two hours duration and level two, 100 multiple choice question and two and a half hours duration, level three, 140 multiple choice question, three and a half hours duration. So exemption policy, an exemption is awarded when a candidate is deemed to have started the CGIA curriculum in a uh, previous qualification or studies which has been assessed using a technique and an academic standard comparable with those applied to the CGIA curriculum. Exemption allows you to start the CGIA charter program at a level that is consistent with the knowledge and skill you gained from previous learning and qualifications. Exam exemption is only offered at level one and level two unless offered the special exemption chartered gateway. So uh, let's begin this journey and apply online via cgiinstitute.org slash registration. The Institute will send you a confirmation email thereafter. So uh, scholarship.
scholarship option, global access scholarship. This scholarship opportunity is open to all registered member of the DCGI Institute, irrespective of your current location and or job role. The Institute award either partial or full scholarship to successful applicants, which will enable them to pursue the CGIA charter program, student members scholarship. All student members of the CGIA Institute are eligible to apply for this scholarship. If you are currently enrolled in a recognized institution of higher learning, then this is your opportunity to secure a CGIA scholarship. A word is stand the chance of winning a full or partial scholarship to pursue the CGIA charter program. Women in finance scholarship. This scholarship is open to all women who are passionate and committed to pursuing a global career in finance and investment. The scholarship offer both full and partial fees discounted scholarship scheme to all women who have enrolled in the CGIA charter program. Media professional scholarship, media professional who communicate, report, and analyze finance, investment, business, and economic news report, etc., are eligible to apply for this scholarship. How to apply for a scholarship? Kindly note that you need to be a registered member of the CGIA, of this CGIA Institute, before you can apply for any of these scholarships. Enroll in the CGIA program, complete the online scholarship application, select scholarship preference, receive final decision on your scholarship application within five to seven working days. So uh, um, actually go to, go to the CGIA website, cgiinstitute.org for further information. Thank you very much for watching this presentation and hope to see you in CGI Institute as a member of the CGI Institute. Can, uh, can we continue?
Uh, good day, anybody. Can you hear me? Hey, Peter, are you around? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, um, okay. Let me let me introduce our today's um, keynote speaker, Mr. John Stolz, FCGIA. John Stolz holds master degree in business leadership, UNISA. He uh, actually uh, in management leadership from University of the Free State. Diploma in the internal auditing from the uh, Twain University of Technology, Life Member International Academy of Project Management. Seems like we're having a connectivity problem. Uh, anybody else experience the same? Uh, although, uh, can you hear I'm if I'm talking, Mr. Hussain? Great. Uh, uh, it seems like we're having a problem from Mr. Ulam to continue with these uh, issues. Um, maybe I should just continue where he lands off. But uh, there he is back again. Mr. Alam, are you okay? Hello? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Uh... Actually, uh, previously, actually, was I uh, audible or not? Uh, you were somewhere and then you just disappeared. Okay, okay. Uh, could you could you could you hear the uh, actually uh, brief, brief about the John Stolls, or or I, I miss it? I I was actually uh, giving the uh, briefing about the uh, our today's uh, keynote speaker John Stoltz. Uh, uh, Mr. Alam, maybe it'll be easier if I introduce myself. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, John... uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. I think it's just going to be easier for everybody. My name is John Stolz. I'm situated in South Africa, uh, in the African continent. I've got a master's degree in management leadership. I, I first gained my first degree in a bachelor's in management leadership from the University of the Free State in South Africa. Uh, I also have a accreditation from uh, CIPS, Certified Inter International Procurement Professionals, of which I am an MSIPS member, and then I am part of, of CGIA, <coughs> sorry. And I got a, uh, a national international diploma in internal auditing, which I acquired many years ago. Uh, that in short is me. Uh, I intend to present something on the project finance risk, new risks and mitigations. From a professional pr uh, perspective, Hello. I am, Yes. Hello, John. John, can you can you can you uh, on your video, please? Or uh, is is your video on or not? My radio. I can hear you talk. Yes. Can you hear me speak? Yeah, I can. I can hear you, but uh, I'm not actually. Uh, you are not actually uh, opening your video. So can you can you open your video, please? Okay. What must I do? uh just on the video uh just put yeah 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 no 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 yeah, you want you please. want to see me you don't want yeah, to yeah. just hear me <laughs> okay 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 so 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 please 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 proceed please proceed okay so uh yes i think any questions from my side regarding my professional position i am managing director of our group holdings company called gbs associates 
We also have a financial services provider company called GBS FinServ. Uh, I'm also the managing director or the financial director, sorry for this, uh, for Afcon Jet Africa. It is a private aviation company where we also do uh, aviation training and instigating. I also did some training cross-border in mainly the many countries uh, across the disciplines of business, uh, which I've terminated because the, the family business is keeping me too busy, too busy now because we also have a development company of which I also finances financial director together with a... Um, yeah, well, there is quite a few, and there is a farmery business where we breed some cows, etc. But yeah, that is basically it. We are very strong in the aviation environment, and and that's it. Thank you very much. That's me. Great, great. So, John, thank you very much uh, for your brief introduction. So, uh, respected participant, uh, uh, the brief introduction uh, about our today's keynote speaker. Uh, you have heard. So now I would request our uh, today's keynote speaker, Mr. John Stolz, to actually proceed with his uh, today's presentation to our today's uh, participant. John, over you, to you. Okay, oh, great. Thank you. You still want to see me? If not, yeah, I think yeah. I'm better. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, can I, I, I want to share a screen with you guys. Please. Uh, I don't know what you see at this point in time. Do you see my PowerPoint presentation? Yeah, yeah, we can yeah. see your PowerPoint. It's called Project Finance Month. Uh, yeah. Risk and new risks and mitigations. Well, good day to you all. I already said that. Uh, thank you for CGI for the opportunity and specifically Paul on the other side that does such a good job to manage this institute. I, I think it is not an easy task. Uh, congrats, Paul. I think you've done a wonderful job up to now and uh, under the leadership of Peter. Thank you for these opportunities. Uh, we, we drive idealistic concepts. Sorry for that. That get by bearings on the line. We drive idealistic concepts that ensure our livelihood while we progress and develop as human sapiens through the exchange of goods and services for an acceptable return through a business processes. This activity brings about risks that need to be mitigated. As the acceptable exchange of goods and services develop, New risks that are created and new mitigations need to be established. Adding the curveball to the risk, we have events that impact our livelihood, events that change our lives, to mention a few. You can see there is the business risks on the side. And then this is a model de designed by uh, Michael Porter. But what Michael Porter's left out as the model, at that point it was not an issue, is social area the social interaction and the social negotiations that we're currently driving through the internet. Now, if we look at the events that changed our worlds in the past, we, there's uh, many of them. The fifth century, we had the downfall of the empire. And I can continue, the Black Death, we lost a lot of people. The, the Spanish Death, we lost 40 million people with, I think, the global population were much lesser at this point in time. So, we can see that we've lost many things. Many things happen in the past that require us to rethink, think on a new level, think on a new way. <clears throat> we recently had the, the internet 1991, which changed the whole world of its approach towards business, approach to, towards social communications. And then we recently has been focused with COVID-19 and then it, ever developing variances. We also recently had yesterday, or today actually, the, all the foreigners withdraw from leaving Afghanistan. 
question is, how is all this going to influence us? And where would it leave us going down the line? Well, I want to take us back to 1784 when the German philosopher, <laughs> Immanuel Kant, was one of the leaders of the philosophical movement that would eventually become known as the so-called Enlightenment. Aufklärung in German, also translated as enlightenment or clarification. In his response to, from a Berlin newspaper, he wrote about enlightenment and that the answer was summoned up with a statement by the Roman poet Uras, namely, sapre ode, or dare to know. With this Kant probably gave the most influential wording of the modern idea of science, namely that the brave are those who want to know, who are not merely satisfied with handed down the answers. Seeking solutions and preventions or mitigations for our dilemmas in business as well as personal, we need to go to the proverbial out of the box. This braveness towards knowledge leads us into a dire arena of contests, concepts, ideologists, and making more our way through conspiracy theories, facing realities of wars, pandemics, riots, tsunamis, disasters, bona fide and malefate human behavior, with dire consequences of all kinds while seeking solutions and or mitigations. These challenges toward our idealistic success thus giving birth to projects. Here I refer to an individual or collaborative enterprise that is carefully planned to achieve a particular outcome. We manifest these projects through concepts whereby we achieve personal or organizational actualization in establishing growth points or expansion points in follow our individual dreams, achieving either self-actualization, growth and profits, or serving communal needs in some form or other. PwC's Global Crisis Survey examines the worldwide business community response to unprecedented social, economic, and geopolitical distribution. They identify three areas for improvement, namely crisis management, business continuity management, and enterprise management. In order to improve, we must use projects in various formats and for various purposes. When we kick off the project process to achieve higher efficiencies, growth, expansion, or creating a service and deciding on what challenge we could face to achieve our outcome, outcome we acknowledge the difficulty to define all the risks. Therefore, our risk identification is an ongoing task throughout a project. Thus, the risk identification for projects is already at a critical point. When we start talking about the intent and the case is formulated for a business initiative. In the establishment of the known and the unknown certainties, we need to look at what is documented in the past on similar projects internally and externally. A consultation session on experts in the applicable industry or fields the project intends to serve also consult on country st stability and the strength of the rule of law in the country as a high priority. A supporting brainstorming session with all the in-house business disciplines using PESTEL as a guidance towards in-house contributions. By various discipline leaders to contribute in the fields of expertise. To maintain a risk register from day one till our closeout, report a submitted and final documentation and obligations. What you see on the screen are six 
are three methodologies that we currently use. We use Six Sigma, Lean, and Theory of Constraints in order to identify and eliminate our risks that we've been tasked with. But this is all taken together with my favorite, the ultimate improvement cycle. You can see it's a combination of Lean, Six Sigma, and Theory of Constraints all put together in one. And that is how we now start targeting our risks and then decide what is important to us. In order to do this, as I said earlier, a project can be looked at as an individual or a collaborative enterprise that is carefully planned. Sorry, I've just lost my... John, it's okay. We can see everything. Okay, please proceed. Okay. An individual or collaborative enterprise that's carefully planned to achieve a particular aim. This brings us to the formal definition of the project by the Project Management Institute. It's important to have this background to understand the risks that we need to mitigate within the project environment. How do we see it and how do we substantiate it? Project management is the use of specific knowledge, skills, tools, and techniques to deliver something of value to people. The development of software for an improved business process, the construction of a building, the relief effort of a natural disaster, the expansion of sales into new ge ge geographic markets. These are all examples of projects. The uncertainty of success is an integrated part of any activity. We undertake as an individual or collaborative enterprises. Our understanding of project process is nicely crafted in the current view of the project management. We can see that it is always need to be within budget, on schedule, and a fit for purpose. So that is basically a successful process without challenges. A project is an activity that has a fit for purpose that is on schedule and within budget. It is the it is this within budget that draws the attention towards the financial risks carried within projects. As with all initiatives in business, there are two outcomes, a successful outcome or a failure outcome, where failure outcomes also refer to incomplete projects. According to the 2019 KPG, AIMP and IPMI Global Survey, only 19% of organizations deliver successful projects, at least most of the time. Only 30% of the organizations deliver on time, 36% deliver projects on budget, 44% deliver projects that meet original goals and business intent. Only 46% of projects deliver receive stakeholder satisfaction. Project finance is a form of secured lending characterized by intricate but balanced risk allocation arrangements. Lenders extend credit, sometimes billions of monetary value to a newly formed, thinly capitalized project company whose core assets at the time of the financial close likely consist of little more, more than a collection of contracts, licenses, and ambitious plans. Hence the focus on prudent risk analysis and allocation. The project company is generally a legally independent special purpose vehicle set up by the project sponsors or the sponsors who can each be a private or government owned entity for the sole purpose of owing, borrowing funds necessary to construct the project. As an example regarding the discussions of the roles of the project company and this project sponsor in a project financing, we look at though the purpose of any project company and therefore the project is deliberately limited, the contractual and commercial arrangement that results from a project financing may be complex and sophisticated, providing carefully for the whole life cycle of the project. Inputs, whether feedstocks or other assets, are sourced and processed, and the output are products that are sold and taken off. 
with the resultant revenues allocated carefully to articulate users. Primary operating costs and debt services often under long-term financing, commercial contracts, many or most of which may have been entered into before construction or beginning of the project even commenced. As we do not live in a perfect world, PMI, Project Management Institute, described the uncertainties, the uncertainty of uncertainties of disrupted occurrences as events and embodied it in the following descriptive analysis. Risk analysis and management is a key project management practice to ensure that the least number of surprises occur while your project is underway. While we can never predict the future with certainty, we can apply a simple and streamlined risk management process to predict the uncertainties in the projects and minimize the occurrence or the impact of these uncertainties. This improves the chance of successful project completion and reduces the consequences of those risks. And in time example of the uncertainty of these uncertainties, even though more knowledge and information about the current COVID pandemic and vaccines is available, than ever before, there's still significant groups of people who suspect the vaccines and refuse to be vaccinated. COVID-19, with a traumatic plunge in oil prices, schools and business shutdowns and increased concerns around the impact of COVID-19, the need for project financiers and borrowers to consider the implications under these finance, doc finance documents encapsulate into the contracts has become more, even more pressing. You can see from a very historical oath that there's two people who didn't understand the conditions of the terms. It was Adam and Eve, or Pope and Hawa, known in Quran. Uh, they did not understand their terms of conditions. And that's the critical part. They eventually lost their, their seats in the, in the garden. In the context of project finance transactions, the interruption of construction or operations can have significant implication. The project company is typically a thinly capitalized special purpose vehicle and lenders have limited or no resources to sponsor in circumstances where the project is. The dilemma of new risks identification could be the triple bottom line, if you have heard of it. Sorry for that. The project, um, the dilemma of the new risk identified could be the triple P model, which you can see on the screen, and the EVA R, well described to us where to find or seek potential risk. Um, the term triple P, yes. Uh, are we going with the same slide? This slide is showing risk contracting methods. Say that again. Risk contracting methods. The Correct. slide. Okay. okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it describes the concept or the methodology by which uh, contents impact on risk and the creation of risk. Sure, sure, please. Yeah, the term triple P is related to the aim of companies and therefore it is related as well to the design of products and services. It refers to the concept of the triple bottom line as formulated by John Alkinton in his book, Cannibals with Forks. According to the triple bottom line concept, equal weight should be given in the corporate activities to the following three aspects, people, planet, and profit. People, the social consequences of its actions, planet, the ecological consequences, profit, the economical profitability. All that this defines is it looks at the, at the complexity of risk definition. So you can see we can look at risks in many spaces or places. The main point is that the bottom line of an organization is not only an economic financial one. An organization is responsible to its social and ecological environment, as well as 
we can look at the mining and transport environmental waste exercises from a big mining environment. You can explain that nice. From this triple P perspective, an organization that considers a strategy of sustainability needs to find a balance between economic goals and goals regarding the social and ecological environment. Remember when the mining communities are critical, when you mine the communities around is critical and they have a big impact in the sustainability of its profits. The idea of the three dimensions originated from the Brundtland report in literature. The P for people is blurred by the fact that companies should take care of their employees anyway in good governance. It should be realized, however, that the P for people in terms of sustainability is primarily related to the people of the developing countries in a matter of a fair global distribution of prosperity. The original idea is that companies and designers must take well-balanced decisions on the three Ps. It is considered as a matter of a trade-off and therefore it is a matter of dilemma. These dilemmas are of a double nature and long-term versus the short. Short, we can see there is the resources impact on the soil. They also show versus the distribution of prosperity. Let's look at that. We can see many spaces where risk can hide, many spaces where mitigations can be sourced from as well. The third P of people of the developing world is of an extreme complex nature. Therefore, the interaction with the other two Ps is less developed in the EVR model. However, the EVR model provides some answers on how to give developing countries a better share in our prosperity and how to provide them with more money to reduce local environmental population. The risk applicable to a project vary from sector to sector and project to project, but they will likely depend on the following. The nature of the project. Through project financing, techniques are used in a number of core sectors, including energy, infrastructure, oil, gas, and mining. The technical details of projects differ hugely, even within the sector. For example, contrast the different technologies used by and the regulation applicable to nuclear and wind power projects or hospitals and transportation projects. However, there are also significant areas of commonality within and across sectors. Most projects require governmental approvals or licenses, rights to use a variety of other assets ranging from real property, particularly in the extraction industries, to intellectual property. With the complexity of a project from a technical perspective being a risk consideration. The location of the project. A project located in a less economical developed country, perhaps one must with unreal, unreliable infrastructure, inclusion, inadequate utilities, transportation options, and social factors, an untested legal regime, raising question over amongst other things, the enforceability and the value of collateral security, or an unstable political climate, potentially undermining the reliability of core host government agreements and relationships, including the concession agreements, other consents and taxation arrangements, or a combination of all of these, will likely pose greater risk than a project located in a more economical developed country. However, more economically developed countries will likely pose different challenges to a project, which can include regulatory risk, the imposition of new or amended requirements in a variety of areas, such as financial tax and environmental regulations, and non-legal scrutiny. Public relations issues, examples in the European Union, would include protests against hydraulic fracturing or fracking, research and development, and the perennial divisions over the merits and concerns relating to nuclear power. Then parties involved in the project. The project are typically sponsored by private companies with particular and usually very extensive experience of the sector, which the project is expected to operate. 
This institutional knowledge provides significant comfort to lenders, but they will also want to know what relevant ex expertise is held within the project company itself or if separate the operator. The private sponsors will likely need to interact closely with governmental or government owned entities contending with political issues or considerations that may not be present where all these counterparties to be entirely from the private sector. For example, the terms of the concession arrangements under which the host country may benefit from the project. In providing or supporting a project financing export credit agencies or ECAs and other internal finance institutions, IFIs, may also bring political support or at least the perception of such support for a project that private sponsors hope will make manage political risks. That is increasing the likelihood that governmental parties will respect commercially negotiated arrangements and regulate reliable and in non-discriminatory manner. However, such ECAs and IF will expect the project company to pay a price in terms of scrutiny from a general information sharing perspective, but also from an environmental and social impact perspective. Not all risks this discussed in this note will be presented in each transaction. For example, currency risks are not relevant in a domestic project finance, but they highlight the types of issues that lawyers should consider when negotiating and drafting project finance dockets. In project financing in the primary, And typically sole sources of income for the prepayment of debt provided by lenders is the revenue generated by the project. This is known as a non-recourse or a limited recourse financing. The result is that until the project is constructed and at least partly operational, the project company will likely not be able to repay the lenders, ensuring the proper and timely construction of the project is therefore a fundamental consideration of all of the parties related concerns include according to this. Now, this is, this is kind of like feeding into risk. We're now starting to look at our risk composition. Is can the project be completed and operated according to the agreed standards and specifications? During the initial stage of the project, the lenders together with the sponsors and the relevant technical experts conduct feasibility and other studies to assess the viability of the project. The parties analyze the design and the specification of the project to determine whether it can generate the revenues necessary to repay the project debt. Performance shortfalls that arise over the life of the project may require a revaluation of the anticipated equity return and debt repayment profile. The second one is, can the project be completed on budget? The parties agree at the outset the amount of funding that the lenders are willing to provide to support the development and construction of the project. Where construction cost overruns arise, the lenders will not expect and will likely not agree to advance additional funds to the project company to help fund the overruns. Thirdly, can the project be completed on schedule? Complying with the construction schedule is critical to ensure that the project company can satisfy its obligations on its off-take agreements and generate revenues to, re to fund scheduled loan repayments. Which party could assume the risk and liability for construction delays, cost overruns, and performance shortfalls? The project company has no independent source of revenue and is not therefore able to bear these costs. Similarly, where the project debt is non-recourse or limited recourse to the project sponsor, the project sponsor is not directly responsible for the repayment of the debt. The lenders and the project company frequently addresses the risk associated with the construction of the project by entering a turnkey construction contract with a construction contractor or contractors under which in exchange for a fixed contract price, any such contractor agrees to construct 
the project by a specific date and in accordance with agreed specifications. The project company will likely retain payment of a portion of the contract price, pending satisfactory completion of the works. Moreover, the contractor assumes the liability through the payment of liquidated damages and indemnities, construction and performance defects and delays. The obligation of these contractors to pay liquidated damages, penalties or indemnities under the construction contract may be supported by parent guarantees, performance bonds or letters of credit. Whether any contractor obligation are supported by parent guarantees, a letter of credit or a performance bond depends on the jurisdiction of the project, the entity or the entities provide support. Particularly in a case of larger projects where construction of the facility may be less straightforward or the technology less proven. The construction contractor may not be prepared to accept some or all construction risk and the sponsor may therefore be required to provide additional support until the project has been constructed to the standards and specifications envisaged prior to financial close. The sponsor may be required to guarantee the repayment in full of any debt financing. We call it the hell or the high water guarantees or provide an intermediate level of support, such as an obligation to fund cost overruns. Sponsor completion support can be by way of simple contractual guarantees or particular, but the balance sheet out of the sponsor is insufficient to support a potential payout under a guarantee. The provision of the letters of credit from the banks or other financial institutions for the benefit of the lenders. Envisage, is the borrower required to provide any information to the lenders? We can see here recently information protection has become a big issue. We found it in South Africa and we call it the Poppy Act. We saw it two years ago in Facebook where they were targeted, we also see protection of information on WhatsApp and all these internet activities. So most facility agreements contain information and annotating with which borrowers need to ensure they comply. The scope of the undertakings will vary across different facilities, projects and sectors, but they are likely to be most extensive during the construction phase of a project. Borrowers will need to consider whether any of these undertakings have been triggered by the COVID-19 outbreak and its impact on the project. Many transactions will also give lenders the right to ask for information and so borrowers will need to ensure that they respond to any such request within appropriate time limits. We envisage also can the lenders call a draw stop if the loan is in the construction phase and has not been fully drawn, the parties will need to consider if any events have occurred, which would allow the lenders to refuse to fund a utilization. Draw stop events typically include an event of default or potential event of default, continuing misrepresentation, the occurrence of or a forecast funding shortfall, and delays in construction. It is likely that COVID-19 may lead to delays in construction. For example, due to staff shortage or issues with the supply of material, as well as a right for lenders to draw stop. This may lead to an event of default for failure to achieve the completion by the scheduled long stop date, either on that date or before if a look forward completion test has been included. Borrowers need to careful be when repeating representations of the purpose of the utilization to avoid misrepresentation. For example, representations relating to project compliance, no breach of law, no default or material adverse changes. This brings us to the next one, we call it the operational risk. Once a project is constructed, it must be operated and maintained in such a manner that the project company can comply with its obligations under the other project documents. 
to ensure that the project operates at the level required to generate the revenues forecasted and needed to repay the loans project participant must, among other things, engage a competent project operator. The operator who may be the project company is responsible for the operations and maintenance of the project. In exchange for a fee, it is a third party. The operator provides certain services. The project needs to ensure the project's operational viability. To ensure the operator is invested in success of the project, the operator is sometimes the project sponsor or one of its affiliates. Obtain insurance. The project is typically insured against property damage and may also obtain third party liability and the business interruption insurance. However, insurance may not be viable for the, for the full. Often very large value of the project or even where it's available, the cost may be prohibitive. Agree to extensive reporting obligations and inspection. Project finance agreements typically include extensive inspection rights and very broad reporting obligations, increasing the likelihood that the lenders will be aware any problems or issues with the object promptly or preemptively and can apply commercial pressure or assist in finding solutions accordingly. Envisage what the expenditure increases as a result. Borrowers may be considering steps to mitigate the impacts of COVID-19, either on the basis of good business practice or due to an obligation to do under its project agreements or off-take agreements. However, lenders often have rights of approval regarding changes to the project budget and expenditure requiring approvals of spending exceeding a certain threshold. Lenders may also have rights to request the borrower to revise budgets in the event there is a change in circumstances which may affect the accuracy of the existing budget. Borrowers will need to keep these budget restrictions in mind when approving any extraordinary expenditure which may be required to mitigate the impacts of the pandemic. If provisions do not allow the requisite flexibility, a borrower may need to request a waiver from lenders of these provisions to allow emergency budget to be approved. Envisage, will events of default be triggered? Aside from the completion the delay event of default, referred to above, there are a number of other events of default which could be triggered such as a result of COVID-19 outbreak. Many of these events will extend to the major project parties. Those parties which are fundamental to the successful performance of the project, including the construction contractor, the operator, the main suppliers and off-takers. These include non-payment. If a project is in the operation phase, principal and interest payments are likely to be due every three or six months. Revenues may, for many operating projects, are likely to be impacted by COVID-19. Lenders might argue that the likelihood of being unable to meet the payment known in advance is an indicator of insolvency or a potential event of default. But facility agreements typically give borrowers the benefit of the doubt until the payment default actually occurs. There is always the chance of an improvement in liquidity, which means that when the time comes, the payment is made. One of the challenges with project financing is that the ability to introduce new money or bring about measures to ease short-term cash flow issues may be constrained by restriction in the finance docket. <coughs> Financial convenience. Project finance documents include financial components to assess the ability of the project company to service each debt, often on a backwards looking and forwards looking basis. It is said correctly, if said correctly, the financial convenience will indicate early signs that the project is not performing as planned. A reduction of revenue is likely to negatively affect compliance with financial convenience leading to either an event of default or a distribution lockup. 
if there is no specific provision for testing at the request of the agent on unscheduled dates, lenders will need to wait for a scheduled calculation date, coinciding with repayment dates to assess the performance. Some project finance facilities allow for equity cures if financial covenants are breached. This is a contractual right for further equity to be injected into the project to count as additional revenue or to repay some of the debt. Cessation or suspension of business. A suspension of all material parts of its business usually constitutes an event of default. This may extend to major project parties. Project document events, project finance facility agreements typically include events of default for matters occurring in respect of the project documents. For example, repudiation of project documents or compliance of the counterparty to a project document, where this is likely to have a material adverse effect. Breach of laws. If a government advice on business conduct during a pandemic or a epidemic is mandatory and is not followed, this may trigger an event of default or a misrepresentation. However, where restrictions are imposed on a project as a result in change in law, borrower, borrowers may be entitled to claim compensation or relief under the project concessions agreement, which will require careful analysis. Cross default. The project company is unlikely to have any other financial indebtedness, but major project parties will default in respect of the indebtedness may impact on their ability to comply with the obligations under the project documents to which they are party. Material adverse effects. The outbreak of COVID-19 has brought with it a much talk of triggering material adverse change or material adverse effect provisions in loan agreements. Whether a material adverse change event of default will be triggered will depend on the drafting in each case. The fact that a party is located in or trading to an area which is affected by the outbreak would not itself constitute a material adverse change in its financial condition. Although, depending on the surrounding facts, it might have a material adverse change in its prospects. However, if a borrower experienced financial difficulties as a consequence of the outbreak, then that deterioration in financial conditions could constitute a material adverse change in its financial conditions. It has been held that for an event to be material, it must A, not be tempor temporary, and B, significantly affect the party's ability to perform its obligations under the contract. To establish a material adverse change is inevitable going to be a highly subjective process involving careful consideration of the drafting and surrounding circumstances. It is often much easier to rely upon the, and enforce the more specific contractual, contractual provisions mentioned above than to argue that the material adverse change has occurred. Insolvency, in worst case scenarios, a borrower may trigger the insolvency event of default. Supply risks. Many projects re rely on raw material or commodities for the project to work. For example, coal or a natural gas fired power plant requires access to and rights to an uninterrupted supply of coal and natural gas. The prices of these commodities can be volatile and the availability for the life of the project is not assured. The project participants can mitigate these risks by executing a long-term supply agreement. A long-term supply agreement ensures or guarantees the project company's access to key supplies at the pre-agreed price. It should be noted, however, that a long-term agreement is often not in the best interest of the project company. For example, if prices drop significantly, the cost under the supply agreement may be significantly higher than what the project company can obtain in the spot market. That is where to be sold at the prevailing market price in the relevant market. Moreover, 
even at the premium price, long-term certainty of supply is not available in some markets, perhaps for reasons relating to the required volumes or specialist natures of the supply supplies required. Selecting a qualified supplier. The supplier must be credit worthy and financially sound so that the likelihood of it becoming bankrupt is minimized. In addition, if the raw materials or commodities are being sourced from the political or economical volatile jurisdictions, the parties may want to consider a supplier with a global reach who is able to source the materials from less volatile places if required. The offtake risk, an important consideration for parties is whether the project will generate the expected revenues or at least sufficient revenues to service the debt and pay the project company expenses and preferable to generate a return for the project sponsor. In addition, the parties must consider how any revenue shortfalls will be addressed to ensure the project generates the level and revenues that the project participants fo forecasted for the success of the project. They may execute a secure offtake agreement where practic practical the parties may negotiate any project offtake contract, such as power purchase agreements on a take on or a take or pay or other firm basis. In a take or pay agreement, the buyer must pay the contract price even if he does not buy or use the entire agreement amount. However, the project products may be highly or somewhat commoditized or marketable or both, such that sales on a shorter term or spot basis may be more appropriate. In these circumstances, priority for the project company likely becomes entering appropriate marketing arrangements Project sponsors often act as a market of, of project projects as they may have relevant experience that they utilize in return for a fee or alternative remuneration or benefit. For example, the right to purchase or sell a volume of product. Select the credit worthy off taker or marketer. If revenue risk is mitigated by a material take or pay agreement, the relevant off-taker must be able to pay the product or service the project is providing. The lenders may therefore require that the off-taker have a minimum credit rating. The project company may also require letters of credit to support the off-taker's payment obligations or affiliate guarantees. Similarly, where a project company is particularly dependent on the skills of a marketer, the lenders will likely be concerned to verify the financial health of and ongoing participation by that entity. Enter into hedge agreements. These agreements may allow the project company to receive payment from a third party in certain conditions apply. For example, the price for the project's output on the spot market falls below a certain amount. Fund reserve accounts, if the project product is to be marketed openly, particularly in commoditized or volatile global markets, the project company may be exposed to significant offtake risk. In addition, or as an alternative to entering hedging and arrangements, project company may therefore be required by the lenders to set aside cash in a secured account designed to be used where volatile revenues are sufficient to meet debt service obligations. Repayment risks. The lender will want to minimize the risk of non-payment by the project company generally. This can occur if the project company generates insufficient revenues, whether due to offset the risk or other causes, has obligations to third parties that takes precedence over the payments to the lenders or is otherwise prevented from making the necessary payments to the lenders. To help ensure that the lenders receive the payments to which they are entitled when and in the amounts due to the parties can set up a debt service reserve account. It is customary in project financing to provide for a dedicated and secure debt service reserve account. This account funded with loan proceeds or project revenues enables the project company to make debt service payments typically for six months. If it does not otherwise have the funds to make them. For example, if there's a problem with a project, 
even when no revenues are being generated, the project company will be obligated to replenish this account as needed, which may be practical if the problem necessitates the use of the account is short term, such as maintenance events. However, the project company may not, of course, be able to replenish it if the project is unable to generate the, the anticipated revenues for a longer period. Apply the ratio tests. The ability of the project company to service debt will generally be tested in project financing based on debt services over ratio and loan life cover ratio test. These will generally apply at financial completion, physical completion, and as a condition to certain acts by the project company, such as the payment of dividends, they may also be tested periodically with failure giving rise to an event of default or other sanctions. Limit the size of the debt. Depending on the project and the project sponsor, the debt to equity ratio may be as high as 80 to 20 or as low as 50 to 50. The proportion of the project cost permitted to be funded by the debt depends primarily on the credit worthiness of the project determined largely by references to financial ratios referred to above. The magnitude of the risks it is exposed to, particularly off the risk and partly by the state of the credit markets at the time the project financing is arranged. Obtain appropriate insurance coverage. In some cases, political insurance risk or PRI may be available to safeguard against political risks. Limit the project company's obligations to third parties. This minimizes the claims that may be brought against the project company by a third party. Where that is not possible, the participant should obtain consent to assignments or direct agreements under which certain third parties agree not to declare a default under or to terminate the agreements or to bring a suit without the lenders. and negotiate broad and comprehensive indemnification provisions for third party claims. Ensure tax obligations and other payments that may have priority over the lenders are paid. Political risks. Some of the main risk is project located is a less economical developed country faces our political risks, also known as country risk, which includes war or civil dis disturbances, expropriation, expropriation, exchange controls, or other dis types of currency transfer limitations. Similarly, a project company will be exposed to change the tax regime applicable in the relevant jurisdiction or the regime specifically created or amended to be applicable to the project company in a jurisdiction with less developed regulations. There are several ways in which political risks may be mitigated. Governmental assurances. This may take the form of comfort letters from the government indicating its support for the project. These letters do not, however, constitute an enforceable obligation or commit by the government to the project. In, in addition, in the event of a change of government, particularly in non-democratic circumstances, the new government may not want to follow the terms of the comfort letter. Stabilization clauses. These are clauses that may be included in term international investment agreements under which the government agrees not to take certain actions or to compensate investors for the cost of certain actions they take. These clauses provide stronger protection than the government comfort letter in that they at least purport to bind any future, as well as the present government to a particular regulatory regime. Sponsors and lenders will therefore be focused on the form of language and the commitment made from an enforceable perspective, but may in any event need to take a view on the likely future political climate in the relevant jurisdiction. Hi, hi John. Yes. Ah. I'll, I'll, I actually, I, I was actually wondering, I see it is a nice presentation. The, the participants are actually enjoying and many of the participants are requesting 
uh, uh, sharing this slide with them. So I think we will be happy to share this slide with the participant. And uh, how long we have to go? Uh, how many slides are left? Because we are running out of time almost. Okay. I have, I think three slides left. Okay, okay. Okay. So, okay, okay. And then, and then we have a question and answer session also. All right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me jump a, bit, a little bit. Yeah, please. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think one of the important ones I need to address is probably currency risks. Well, currency risk addresses uh, is the power of purchase agreements on the gas. So there is a currency issue. We're all uh, comfortable with currency and the way it's uh, applied. Uh, currency is up and down, all depends on the, on the country's stability of its currency. Uh, so that will give us, and that is quite applicable in the loan environment, specifically where we need payments. The authorization risk of certain projects depend on the obtaining of continued availability of uh, governmental organization, uh, authorizations to continue with licenses, et cetera, specifically on long-term uh, issues. So question is, if there's a change in government, how will you ensure the continuance of the license to be applicable, uh, like drilling permits, et cetera? And then uh, the last uh, dispute resolution risk is how can how can we resolve and make the international project finance transactions? The parties must determine the law that should govern their transactions. We can see this very clearly in in the NECs and the FIDIC uh, contract uh, formats, as well as the J JTCs. It is a governed and accepted. So it is very fine. Okay, rounding out in 2021, top five risk for financial services, not necessary project financing, but an integrated part of the adoption of the digital technologies required new skills, significant in an, um, existing employees, economic condition constraints, growth opportunities and privacy identity management has become a big issue and information security. People are forced to work from home. This creates management issues. Uh, the, the nexus between <coughs> economic concerns and COVID-19, it's long light. Uh, security risk affect the realities of COVID-19. This raised a new privacy security concern and reinforced frequent warnings. Force majeure, we can see that it is important to note that financing agreements will not include force majeure or change of law provision. The obligations to repay loans, big issue. Uh, interest rate risks, interest may be charged at the fixed rate and variable risk, and it can, and we can have a flotation rate calculated by the reference of cost. The spread of margins, one point based is 100. Right. Not, and then we do have the uh, social risk. Infrastructure projects generally have an important impact, local communities. We see spe this specifically in the mining environment where we make use of people locally and we need to feed back into this. So these risks and the availability of the people, also the uh, perception of the co company counts a lot in this type of issues. But yeah, these are just normal kind of risks in social environment. Let's, let, uh, let's look at risk drivers. The continuing global challenges and potential ex existential threat posed by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, political divisiveness and polarization, social and economic unrest, gridlock, artificial intelligence, automation and other rapid developing te digital technologies, rapid shift to virtual remote work invites, changes in the geopolitical political, uh, 
landscape shifting, customers' preferences and the demographics, fragile supply chains, wildfires and hurricanes, volatile employment levels and record low interest rate, escalating competition for specialized talent. Immigration challenges, cyber breaches on a massive scale, terrorism, big data analytics, future of work. These and the host of other notable risk drivers are all contributing to significant levels of uncertainty, making it extremely difficult to anticipate what risk may lie just over the horizon. Unanticipated events are unfolding at record pace, leading to massive challenges to identify the best next steps for organizations of all types and sizes. Regardless of where they reside in the world, no one is immune to the significant levels of uncertainty and the sea suits and boards need to be vigilant in scanning the horizon for emerging issues. Of course, no one can possibly anticipate everything that lies in the future. Organizations must focus on building trust-based resilient cultures led by authentic leaders that can pivot at the speed of change. What can parties do to protect themselves? Project companies should check the finance agreements to ensure that they continue to comply with their obligations. Even if there is no specific requirement to inform the lenders, they should consider opening communication channels early if issues are foreseen or arise. If they have not already done so, project companies should liaise with their project document counterparties to identify potential issues and to agree how to deal with them. Parties should consider whether the project insurances covers any delay in construction or business interruption because of the outbreak. However, these policies will usually respond in a limited circumstances where there, are, there has been physical damage to the project so policies should be checked carefully and advised from insurance advisors. So to say, ascertain the levels of cover these provide. While I think risk is like a fire, you never know where it's gonna run. Thank you very much. Welcome, thank you very much. John, uh, it was actually a wonderful slide presentation. Uh, we all actually enjoyed your presentation. It was very, very insightful and very, very much learning for us. So now, uh, actually, we are requesting the question from the participant. Uh, dear participant, if you have any question, please raise. Now, actually, I have seen uh, Botema raised the hand, so uh, please uh, speak to our uh, keynote speaker, opening your mic. Uh, sorry, where are we now? Uh, we are in the question answer session. I, I do see it. it. Which one do you want me to address? Uh, one minute, uh, the one participant will raise a question, uh, actually, uh, who raised hand? Raise then. Yeah, 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 yeah. Please, uh, actually, uh, ask your question to the keynote speaker, please. I um, I don't uh, carry any noises. I don't see anything written. I uh, am uncertain. It's okay. one of the of, of the risks now. Uncertainty. It's the uncertainty uh, of the uncertainties. <laughs> <laughs> the participants cre create now a big uncertainty. Yeah. So, so you, you, you actually provided a lot of insight how to mitigate the risk, as yeah. especially, especially in the project financing, the most important uh, thing in the business arena right now. So uh, it was wonderful, actually, how to mitigate the risk, especially the new risk. So... Uh, thank you very much for your nice presentation. And now, actually, with the closing note, I would like to thank all the participants who participated and enjoyed the today's session. And we invite all the participants to join us in CGI Institute. And uh, we, will, we will actually 
always serving we will always serving the professional to be certified and to be uh, awarded with the charter from the cgi institute so from our presentation you have uh, actually noticed uh, how to be a member of the institute and how to apply for the exemption and what are the uh, papers to enroll and how to sit for the examination, everything. So we welcome all the participants uh, come to CGI Institute and uh, get the professional uh, identification and dignity, uh, which will be very helpful for your um, career. So I'd like to thank our uh, today's keynote speaker, John Stoltz and our institute president, Peter Edward Wells, and uh, our uh, the special and the key person, uh, Paul Primpong, and uh, all the participants uh, who participated in today's session. And uh, see you again in a very short time with uh, uh, again a further uh, session uh, in webinar. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. What's good to talk to you all. Have a nice evening. I've got evening now. I don't know you guys, but yeah, go well, serve well. Thank you. Bye bye.